Chapter 5 Angel or Drug Dealer It was August 1971, the year of my great adventure. Erica and Hilary, my two 19-year-old travelling companions, and I were sitting on our bunks in a Corfu youth hostel, debating whether we should use our dwindling funds to travel onto Athens or stay put for a week on this still unspoiled Greek island. We opted to stay, enjoy more local Greek salads, learn their dignified plate-smashing dances, and relax on white sandy beaches. Then we would hitchhike home through Italy, Switzerland, and France to England. Now, nine days later, under a cloudless blue sky, we were crossing the border from Italy into Switzerland. After the relentless honking of horns, persistent leering shouts from the Italian men, and the general raucousness of the country, the hushed silence of Switzerland was for me a welcome relief. I love the Italians, but I could never live in Italy, I told Erica and Hilary as we stood on the side of the road heading for Zurich, our thumbs in their usual hopeful vertical position. In stark contrast to the chaos and messiness of Italy, all around us were lush green hillsides and pristinely clean, neat, wide roads. I was also glad to be out of Italy as the cheap bread that was our perpetual diet was salty and spongy and left me feeling hungrier than before I had eaten. Not that the Italians didn't make great bread. They did. We just couldn't afford it. Before we had left on this adventure across Europe, the three of us had agreed that there would be no lending. We would all take the same amount of money. But when I had returned in July from my brother's wedding in Canada, the girls informed me that they had brought forward the date of our departure. While Erica and Hilary had each left with £45, the most I could scrabble together through temporary secretarial jobs and other acts of desperation was a mere £40. Oh well, I thought, I'd manage somehow. My stomach was rumbling now. I would have to get used to that. My funds were almost out. I would only have enough for one more meal, but then it was going to take two days to get through Switzerland and France to Dieppe where we would catch the ferry to New Haven and home. I hate being hungry. Must be the tourists in me. We like our food, but at least I had my ferry ticket. I will survive, I told myself. I won't like it, but I will survive. The turquoise blue Volvo was slowing down. Excitedly, we ran toward it. I was the one with a smattering of French and German, so the girls had appointed me as professional front seat passenger. Wohin fahren Sie? I asked the middle-aged businessman in polite German. Zurich, und Sie? Das ist gut, I responded, sounding like a tacky tourist. Moment mal. He gestured for us to wait before climbing in. Stiff-shouldered, he stepped out of his car, came around the back, opened the boot, and indicated that we should unload our huge grubby backpacks into the vacant space. Before he had pulled back out into the traffic, he announced, If you don't mind, I would like to practice my English. His pronunciation was amazingly clear of the usual formal accent. I do a lot of business in Japan, and we always speak English, he explained. After hitchhiking in Europe for four weeks, we were in the habit of assessing our drivers. Contrary to my mother's dastardly predictions that we would all be raped and murdered, the kindnesses that we had been shown, people driving for hours out of their way, taking us home and making us lunches, buying us dinners, even giving up their beds for us, had more than reinforced my faith in humanity. Dressed in the mand mandatory charcoal suit, this man with short greying hair and intelligent brown eyes set in a squarish face appeared to be a typically Swiss conservative businessman in his mid-forties. Married, quiet, refined, sophisticated, worldly, I surmised. Where have you been travelling, he asked, as the green hills whisked by us. We started in Dieppe and then hitchhiked down through Strasbourg, Luxembourg, Italy, and then over to Greece. That's very brave of you, he said, his V sounding faintly like an F. I shrugged. Wasn't the whole world hitchhiking these days? The hostels were bursting with multinational hordes, all catching rides to somewhere, many of them around the world. Their stories made our adventure sound like a stroll in the park. 
Have you had any bad experiences? He inquired, eyes on the road ahead. Just hunger, I wanted to say, but he might take that as an unsubtle hint. No, actually, people have been exceedingly kind, even when we didn't speak each other's language. We drove in silence for a while, as if he was contemplating his next sentence. I'm meeting my wife in Zurich for lunch. Would you and your companions like to join us? My stomach thanked him immediately, but I showed polite restraint. That would be wonderful, but I need to consult with my friends. With eyes glistening at the thought of real food, even if it was a breakfast, I cranked my head around the headrest and told the two girls we had been invited to lunch. I was afraid Erica might turn the invitation down, thinking we were not dressed appropriately. She was unpredictable, but they both nodded vigorously, salivating as I was, at the prospect of anything other than salty bread. Yes, we would love to, I told the man. By the way, my name is Kate, and my friends are Erica and Hilary. I am Volta Weiss, and my wife is called Regina. Erica might have been justified in saying we weren't fit to be seen with this smartly attired man. As we entered the Mervenpick restaurant on the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich, all eyes turned on us. Office workers in uniform like suits of grey or navy were dressed in dignified contrast to us, three ragamuffins in faded jeans, t-shirts barely covering suntanned arms, our sun blonde hair scraped back into scruffy pigtails. Mr Vice didn't seem to mind the gaping stares, but strode through the lively restaurant as if he arrived every day with three urchins he had just picked up off the autobahn. His wife, Regina Weiss, when we found her sitting at a table next to the window, was equally nonplussed. A pretty lady with piercingly tragic blue eyes, she recovered quickly when her husband explained in his quiet manner that he had just encountered us on the outskirts of Zurich. When he told her that we were travelling around Europe, her eyes sparkled momentarily. Then she checked her emotions, as if it was unseemly to show delight. You must tell me all about it, she said, sucking needily on a cigarette. A waiter instantly appeared with the largest menus I had seen since being in Canada. What do we pick? I thought, embarrassed. Bratwurst or steak? Pick anything you would like, Mr. Weiss offered, reading my mind. After a steady diet of bread and cheese and vitamin C tablets for a month, we had lain in our bunks for the last five nights, describing to each other in minute detail the first meal we would eat on our return home. I fantasized about a nice big steak with a beautiful green salad. Hilary wanted a humongous bowl of sweetened red raspberries loaded with Devonshire cream, and Erica, the skinniest one of us all, wanted a plate piled high with fish and chips. Why don't you order for us? Erica piped up, addressing Mr. Vice. Thank you, Erica. If you like, he responded. Immediately, three glasses of Coke arrived, and Regina watched, a slight smile on her lips, as our English manners temporarily forgotten, we guzzled the contents of the glasses. Mr. Vice va waved a hand, and immediately three more Cokes appeared. It is such a shame, Mrs. Vice said, but we are leaving tomorrow to go on a holiday in Tessin. I understood Tessin to be the Italian-speaking region of Switzerland, full of rolling hills and vineyards. Otherwise, we would love to have you come and stay with us. Something caught in her voice, as if she really didn't want to go on holiday now. Something desperate. That would have been charming, nicht? Her husband, I noticed, was watching his wife very carefully, as if he was afraid she would, what, disintegrate into little pieces? Give away a secret? Her petite elegance and the way she held her cigarette between long, slim fingers with perfectly manicured nails contradicted the aura she was emanating. There was something else. What was it? Loneliness? Fear? Fragility? Plates with green melon and delicate slices of pink parma ham were suddenly placed before us. Oh, heaven, real food. But you must stay and explore Zurich. Mr. Weiss added, looking for agreement from his wife. It is such a beautiful city. Mrs. Weiss nodded as she took another sip of a gin and tonic. Oh yes, very beautiful. I peered out of the restaurant window down the long straight street. 
A blue and white tram hummed quietly past, and an array of shops promised expensive chic. Nothing in our price bracket. Maybe we could stay with you next year, Erica said, blue eyes twinkling. We had already played with the idea of a sequel adventure. Oh, Regina gasped, that would be so wonderful. In between the blissful taste of sweet unsavory, I wondered about Regina Weiss. She was on her second gin and tonic. She wasn't eating much, just picking at the food. And her eyes bothered me. Had she been crying? And why were they so desperate for us to stay with them? Maybe they had lost a child and we were a brief consolation prize. There seemed to be an easy intimacy between the couple, but knowing how my own parents could put on a show, I thought it could have been for our benefit. There was definitely something hidden, something terribly sad. The main course arrived on a silver trolley from which the waiter deftly carved wafer-thin slices of Chateaubriand. He placed the rare meat on large white platters, topped them with sauce bayonnaise, and filled up the empty white space with a mountain of crisp French fries and green salad. Once we were all served, silence descended upon the table as the three of us drifted into gastronomic heaven. We've been dreaming of a meal like this, Hilary told them between mouthfuls. Mrs. Weiss lit another cigarette. So how long are you going to stay in Zurich? She asked brightly. Was her mood lightening with her company, or was it the effect of the G&Ts? I shrugged. Not too long. I didn't want to disappoint her, tell her we couldn't afford to stay in their wonderful hometown, even in the hostel. This meal would make the journey home a lot more bearable, though. She leaned across the table towards her husband and said something in German which I couldn't catch. Mr. Weiss nodded and got up from the table. Excuse me, I have to make a phone call. We had a strange experience the very first night in Reims, Erica was telling Mrs. Weiss. The lights were on, sleeping bags on the beds, clothes everywhere, but no one was home, like the Mary Celeste. Mrs. Weiss didn't know about the Mary Celeste, a cargo ship found sailing in the Atlantic in the late 1800s, mysteriously empty of passengers and crew. Anyway, we ended up staying with a young French couple who rescued us from sleeping in the local jail. Mrs. Weiss's eyes glistened with something, as if on the edge of a great joy or terrible sadness, or both. She was drinking us in like a woman dying of thirst, except that she'd had enough to drink. Her husband sat down again. I'm very sorry, but after dessert, I will have to go to a meeting, so I will take you back to the car and you can get your bags. Was her vice psychic? Three bowls piled high with raspberries and dollops of fresh whipped cream arrived. Hilary and I exchanged looks. This meal was spookily reminiscent of the menu all three of us had envisioned. When lunch was over, the businessman suddenly stood up, our signal to leave. Somewhat hurriedly, we scribbled addresses on scraps of paper, and in return we were each given Mr. Weiss's business card. With warm goodbyes, we left Mrs. Weiss alone again at the table, a fresh gin and tonic for company. The brightness that had been briefly rekindled in her eyes was already dimming again. Then her husband led us back to the underground, where he had parked the car. En route, he pointed to the bridge on the other side of the Zurichsee. The hostel is over there, he said. With exceedingly full stomachs, we struggled with our backpacks while Mr. Weiss rummaged in his glove compartment. We stood and waited. He emerged with something small in his hand. In the shadowy darkness of the underground, it was difficult to see what it was. Here is approximately 21 pounds in various currencies. I recognised then that he was clutching a roll of banknotes. I really want you to stay and see Zurich. I'm just sad that you can't be our guests. All three mouths were agape. No was the first word that came out of all of us, but then Hilary spoke. It's very kind, but no thank you. But I want you to see Zurich, he persisted, thrusting the roll towards Hilary. You've been kind enough. The lunch, Hilary responded, while Erica and I just nodded. No, we can't take any money from you. I insist, Mr. Weiss responded, and then he threw the roll into the air 
and it landed expertly between Hilary's breasts, where the slit in her T-shirt opened onto her ample chest. Initially stunned, she finally reached in and pulled out the roll. By this time, he was halfway across the parking garage. We all stared at one another, and then after him. Eventually, when our eyeballs had settled back into our heads, we ran to catch up with the retreating figure. Who was he? I wondered. An angel? People on our journey, especially women, had been kind. But in my short and cynical experience of men, I found that they normally wanted something in return. But he didn't seem to want anything. We called after him as he hurried along the street, away from us. Thank you, we shouted into a light breeze that carried our voices away. Thank you. Mr. Vice didn't even turn, but waved a hand as if suddenly tired of us. Or was he concealing some other emotion? Stunned, we stood rooted to the spot in the afternoon sunshine, watching him disappear into the melee of Friday afternoon shoppers. Amazing, Erica exclaimed. Exactly, I added, unable to put into words how uplifted I felt, and not just by the food. What shall we do? Hilary asked, staring at the thick roll of notes held together in a rubber band, still in her hand. Let's go and get the money changed first. Erica, ever the practical one, suggested. Find out exactly how much we have before we make any plans. Set on Swansig Font, the man behind the bars of the Bureau du Change informed us as he pushed the notes under the grate. Twenty-six pounds? We were rich. This will give us another two weeks travelling, Erica calculated. Where shall we go? Hilary asked, still stunned by this miracle. We could go back to Athens, Erica suggested. Or Yugoslavia, I offered. How about the south of France, Hilary proposed. We could have a week on the beach, then head straight home. Yes, Erica and I chimed in unison, the idea of beaches and sand beckoning yet again. The next day, after a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast of Ruhr and Speck, scrambled eggs and ham, we stood on the steps of the hostel, overlooking the bridge and the skyline of the city with its onion tower. Mr. Weiss was right. Even in the rain, Zurich was like a beautiful, dignified, older lady. As I stood there, a voice inside told me, you will come back here to live and learn German. What do you think? Erector asked. Let's keep moving on, Hilary muttered. Yes, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Weiss, but it won't be any fun sightseeing in this rain. As we turned in the direction of the autobahn, I felt a twang of guilt as though we were betraying our saviours, but it was time to head south. Erica was right. The extra money extended our freedom by exactly a fortnight. Unfortunately, the postcard that I had sent my mother, advising her of our extended trip, arrived in England two days after we did. For two whole weeks, she had envisioned our nasty demise. I paid the emotional price for that extra freedom. The voice that told me I would return to Zurich was also eerily right. As fate would have it, through my father's business connections, I was offered the position of au pair and landed at Zurich Airport just one month later. I had left through the back door, but now at the airport with my family, the Simmels, to greet me, I was returning to make a dignified entrance into that fair city through the front door. Six weeks later, after I had settled in and quickly acquired a rudimentary knowledge of basic German, I clutched Mr. Weiss's white business card in one hand and the Simmel's red Space Age phone in the other. I was both shy and excited. Wouldn't he be gratified to know that at least one of us had fallen in love with Zurich, enough to return for a year? How would he react? I dialed, then waited. Instead of a ringing, an obnoxious monotone droned in my ear. Hmm. I checked the number on his business card and dialed again. Same tone. Maybe they had moved. Oh well, call him at the office in Vintitur, an area ten miles north of Zurich. The same drone tone. The phone book. But no vice, let alone W or R. This is strange. Maybe the operator could help. Tod me lied. The operator apologised in her guttural Swiss. It's gibt kein Walter Weiss. No, Mr. Weiss. 
but he had looked like a solid, respectable businessman with a wife and no children. Even if he had moved, wouldn't he have left a forwarding telephone number, an address, something? Finally, I sought out the assistance of my employer. Frau Simmel's sister worked for the government, and she could find anything about anybody. Though Switzerland was far from a communist regime, it was still law to register a move from one canton to another. They knew where the citizens resided, for the most part, but even the government had no record of a Walter or Regina Weiss. Did he even exist? Maybe he was an angel who had arrived in our hour of need, or mine anyway. He was an international businessman, as evidenced by his impeccable English and the role of banknotes in various currencies. But what kind of business? Industrial espionage? Arms? Drug dealing? Angel or drug dealer? Drug dealer or angel? Hmm. Maybe all I needed to know is that he was an angel to me.